Okay. Yes, sir. What is causing the clouds, the thing to go up? Is that high pressure, low pressure, or how does that affect What causes the air to rise, actually? Yeah. His question is, what causes the air to actually rise? There's a couple things that can do that. Cold fronts will do that. A cold front is simply a, basically a dome of cold air, which has higher pressure behind it because it's, it's, it's uh, more dense and it's tending to subside or sink, so the pressure is higher at the surface. But it acts like a dome. It has actually kind of a surface on it like this, and it moves typically south or southeastward as it moves along. And the air out in front of it that's moist and warm is less dense and tends to rise. And so as that cold air comes along, this air will tend to rise over it. And at some point it gets cold enough as it lifts to make a cloud. Um, other things can do that as well. Thunderstorms, they always cave in, right? What goes up? Thank you. Seventh graders can do that. What goes up must come down. So a thunderstorm eventually dies, comes down, the cold air spreads out on the ground and that makes a mini cold front of sorts. As that goes out, it pushes warm air up, another thunderstorm pops up. You watch that in the summertime. You'll see when one dies, another one will pop up pretty quick after that quite often. Um, some other things, just a hot day, especially in the hills and mountains. As the sun shines on the ground, it's shining at an angle. But if it hits a mountainside like this, it's shining at close to a 90 degree angle and heats up the air above that, or the ground actually, and the ground heats the air and it rises. So you tend to get clouds above ridge tops first. And if it continues to heat, it can keep rising. And again, depending on that temperature structure in the atmosphere, if it's cold enough up here and warm air rises, if the warm air is surrounded by colder air, then that warm air is more buoyant and it's going to keep rising. More clouds, precip, thunder, hail. Okay, so there's, there's a few ways you can do that. Okay, bottom line. If you see clouds on satellite, the air is generally moving up. If you see no clouds on a satellite, the air is generally, move, generally moving down. Does that make sense? Clouds? Up. No clouds? Down. You're getting better. Getting better. <laughs> I'm not going to be so embarrassed on YouTube now. Probably. Okay. Three basic types of satellite imagery. Okay, and I just want you to remember these. You'll see all these on the news. You'll see all these on, on the internet. For instance, I'll give you the location of our website later, and you can go to the government's uh, weather websites and actually look at you know, live uh, satellite data, or mostly live. There's a delay as it's fed into the system and goes out, but it's pretty good. The first one we're going to look at is visible satellite imagery. Visible imagery is what you would see if you were actually sitting on a satellite 22,500 miles in orbit, up in orbit around the Earth, looking down with your eyeballs. Okay, now it's in black and white typically because color imagery is expensive. And for weather forecasting, we don't really need to see what color the plains are or the mountains. We need black and white, that's fine. And it works great and it doesn't take as long to transmit either because the files are smaller. But it's available only during the daytime. That's the drawback because the sun's shining, you can see, you can't see at night unless there's lights out and neither can the visible satellite camera. So that's a big limitation. You know, sunset comes, visible's gone, right? A lot of times, especially during high sun times like midday, there is little distinction between cloud elements. I'll show you what I mean here in a second. What I'm saying is the definition and the contrast between high and low clouds or things, small elements, large elements, is not very good because the sun's shining right down on it. But at sunrise and sunset, when the sun's at an angle, it starts casting shadows on cloud tops, and then you start picking up these things. So sometimes the day are better for visible, and other times the day are not as good. I'll show you what I mean again. And sometimes white, bright clouds, which are reflecting sunlight, will mask surface features like big snow fields on the ground. White is white. You know, snow reflects it, clouds reflect it, they look the same. So what you're going to look for which one moves, snow or clouds? clouds? Thank you. Clouds move, okay? Clouds move, snow does not. If a huge snowfield the size of Colorado starts moving southward, something's up. I don't know what. All right, first of all, let's go to just a still image. This is a visible satellite picture of valley fog. 
I love this stuff because I love looking at maps of terrain and mountains and valleys. And I, to be a meteorologist, you gotta love maps. You just do. Okay, that's one thing that tends to lead you into this. Well, there's Lake Erie. Let me use my little pointer. Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, north is roughly this way. Over here, what do you think that is? Chesapeake Bay. Okay, DC is in here somewhere. Um, this is Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware's out here, New Jersey. Okay. This, I believe, is the Rappahannock River. This is the James River. And this, I think, is Albemarle Bay in North Carolina, which is due east of us here. So if we go due west, somewhere around in here, we start to look, we're around Kingsport, somewhere around in here. I couldn't exactly identify the location, but it doesn't matter so much. The point is, all this is fog in river valleys. Remember that question he had about how else can you form a cloud? Cold air is denser, so it sinks into the river valley where the moisture is. Cold air grabs a hold of that moisture, condenses it into cloud, fog. And so these are all low-lying areas, and the mountaintops are out of the fog. Same with here. These are little rivers, I think, flown out of North Carolina. Okay, into Tennessee. Uh, and these are all, again, valleys. This, if this is Lake Erie, this is the state of Ohio. Almost the whole southern border of the state of Ohio is the Ohio River. So if you live along the Ohio River almost its whole length, it's a pretty foggy day early in the morning. Now, that's not, it may be very dense in places, but as the sun comes up, it's going to start to heat the ground from the edges where it can shine on the ground and the ground will warm up and that'll make the air dry out a little bit and the clouds will, or the fog will start to dissipate from the edges in. You can watch that on satellite too. It's pretty fun to watch as I get loops going, see that fog start to dissipate. Now there are times when the forecast will say, you know, foggy in the morning becoming partly sunny in the afternoon or sunny. Most places that'll work out. But there's always that one stinking place right in the middle of that fog bank where it just keeps going like this and this and this, and that town will stay foggy all stinking day long, and they think we are the worst forecasters in the history of the planet. You know, and really, on the scale of the globe, to forecast for East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia is pretty dang good. <laughs> and then, to get down to the size of a county, is, we're experts, and we miss that one little town, and that's all anybody remembers. But I'm not bitter, okay. <laughs> So this is visible satellite. Now at night, you can't see that, right? Because the sun went down. So fog at night is really tough to see. They've got some other satellite, some cameras that, that detect different wavelengths of energy emitted from the Earth. And there's some progress made in looking at cloud banks, <coughs> low cloud banks at night. Uh, it's kind of difficult to interpret, but it's a lot better than what we used to have, which was, <laughs> so it's better. Okay, now, here's a loop, and this doesn't stop, so I'm going to talk about things, and we'll come back to it as we go along. This was on Tuesday of this week when the heavy rain started. This is the visible satellite image, okay, and it goes along, again, from, from sunrise to sunset, and that's all we get. Now, the sun's down over here, so there's still clouds in there. It's just night, so you can't see anything. And then it skips over again. It skips those times because... Why take images when the whole United States is in dark? It's just a waste of resources. So it'll skip and come back to the, the sunrise again. See this line here? Okay, that's the sunset line. Let's watch the sunrise line. It actually looks like this. Because the Earth is at an angle to the sun, 23 and a half degrees, and the northern hemisphere is pointed away from the sun this time of year. So you're going to see this slanted sunrise angle. It goes across the United States, but then as the Earth turns and revolves around, the sun is at a different angle when, it, when the sun's going down, obviously. It sets in a different place. And so the, the angle of sunlight is different as sunset comes along. Yes, sir? How much time does it take? These are photographs of them. Yes. And the satellite is shooting them at a, as it orbits the Earth. Right, taking and pictures. You mean this whole loop yeah. or one image? Mm -hmm. The whole loop? Yeah, you look at something like that. How long does it take the satellite to take that particular view? 